And I'd like to introduce Luke Jenkins. Luke is uh, the museum's uh, chief curator and exhibition designer, but he also had developed the concept of a project of concerning belonging um, that morphed into something that combined both concerning belonging and research development. Uh, the idea that the artists are actually occupying our space, getting to use our resources, getting to work with NOVA uh, faculty that uh, focus on a lot of the uh, topics and issues that they're dealing with, and um, also to use the uh, resources that we have at our AutoNation Academy. Uh, so that's another plus as well, our, our um, ceramic studio, our um, uh, print workshop, our graphic and computer uh, lab. So the idea is to be able to make use of all of this in order to uh, further their practice. So um, thank you, and thank you, uh, Luke, for developing this project. Thanks. So, so Luke and I are going to be moderating it, but um, first I should ask Luke, um, how did you come up with this project, which was already in place before I had gotten here? And, um, I, uh, I went to the Netherlands in 2008 to uh, get a master's in sustainable and humanitarian design, and I, um, I basically missed the entire recession. Um, so when I came back at the end of 2010 um, to just uh, work on crew installing a, a show uh, at this museum, I don't know if any of you are familiar with what was going on at the library right across the street, but that was you know pretty much uh, just every every square foot of grass on the park was you know basically someone living there just you know waiting waiting for something to happen for all these displaced people and I um, you know I talked to people here at the museum about possibly doing a project that tries to merge art which uh, has a lot of possibilities it's kind of you know um, let's say a, a moving discipline you know something that can uh, affect a lot of emotion in people and a social issue like homelessness we went after the grants um, through putting our sprout initially, and we received it. So that was kind of the beginning of this project um, to basically have um, artists who had worked with uh, either homeless people in the past or other social issues, uh, both in their personal lives and their professional work, um, work with the homeless at a, at a shelter. We chose for our partnership with the homeless, which is right up the street, uh, pretty much. Is a really, they have a really supportive, um, sorry, I lost my word, um, but they, they have a lot of different um, avenues of, of support for the clients that they have at the shelter. Um, so some of the artists here are working with those uh, people, the, the, the clients at the shelter there, as well as um, everyone kind of working with the theme of um, belonging homelessness uh, throughout the different parts of the museum on the second floor. and. Um, it's probably something that's going to, um, you know, start centrally in that second floor gallery area, and um, you know, possibly move out from there into different parts of the museum, and um, possibly, you know, throughout the downtown area, depending on um, what some of the artists are interested in doing. You know, some of them have, uh, have talked about that. You know, since Tasha is here, maybe we should move over. Missing one artist. Okay, so how did you go about selecting the first group of artists? Um, it was pretty much, um, you know, what I knew of artists in, in South Florida and, and the type of work they did. So some of it was people I knew. Um, I knew Augustina pretty well before that, and I knew uh, Natasha a bit. So I, I talked to both of them about it, and they were both basically like, "So what did Antonia say?" <laughs> um, and I was like, "Who's Antonia?" <laughs> so, uh, so I got in touch with Antonia um, because it was, you know, pretty much it was it was already a done deal, pretty much in in both of their minds. So Antonia said, "Yeah," and um, and that's how it all started in terms of choosing the artists. And why was it so important for Antonia? I mean, I know because I've worked with Antonia, but um, Augustina, why did you think it was so important that Antonia was the obvious choice? For You know her work, right? I guess. <laughs> Pretty obvious. 
Glenn and Tony, and you've worked um, a lot with uh, Locus uh, at a Lotus House in, my, uh, in Miami, which is a shelter for women. And um, you did a particular project that was pretty amazing and relates very much to this um, this particular project. Can you want to talk about it a little? Um, yeah, I work with the Lotus House. Um, it's a shelter that's in Overtown in Miami, and it uh, helps women and children in need. And um, women can stay there for up to a year, and it offers a lot of holistic services to really help women transition into permanent housing. And like Luke, I look around time of the recession, I was just seeing just so much poverty, and I really didn't understand it. So as a way to learn more about it, I thought of this idea of moving into the shelter uh, for a month and to live as like a guest would of the shelter. So I did that, and in April of 2012, I lived at the shelter for one month, and I had roommates, and I had a curfew, and I had a counselor, and I was drug tested, basically everything that a woman at the shelter would experience. And then while I was there, I taught um, art classes and um, like workshops, and I made a big series of videos working one-on-one -on -one with the women at the shelter. Um, yeah, basically, really, my goal there was to increase the artistic environment of the space while learning about it. Um, you want to tell about that project, the um, one with uh, shooting the sun? Because yeah. that was quite wonderful. Um, this project is called Women Who Stand on the Sun, and um, they, I would work one-on-one -on -one with each woman every day, and a different woman each day, and um, they would lay on their back, and I would give them my camera, and they would put their feet up uh, on the sun, and it looks like this kind of optical trick where it looks like your feet are actually standing on the sun. And then they would make this video um, as long as they wanted to, and it was them just like playing around with their feet on the sun, and they would eclipse it, and they would move it, and, um, I just really love this idea that these women had this power uh, within them that no one else in the world had. Like that they were the only ones who could walk on the sun. And this idea that um, wherever they went, they carried this within them. And also too, like I think when you are without a permanent home, like you feel very heavy sometimes. And in the videos, they all look very like free and light and like they're very like, beautiful. And you also did work at the Lotus House too, right, Augustine? Yes, um, around the same time, <coughs> through, through really an, an auction uh, that maybe some of you are familiar with the Margaris Collection. Uh, the Margaris Collection is a very big supporter of the Lotus Shelter. And um, um, <coughs> they do this auction once a year where they invite, they ask artists to give them an, uh, an artwork and with the profits of this artwork being sold in auction, all this money goes straight to the shelter. And at the time when the director of Lotus Shelter came to me, I was working in only one piece in my studio and it was incredibly large. And my work is very labor intensive and usually the scale the scale of it is quite large, not necessarily in 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 size, but the the processes maybe take for long as one year. So I really didn't have anything to give for this auction, but I did want it to help. It was challenging to give a piece that I was working all year, right, for an auction to, but yet I wanted it to help. So I was putting this. Um, challenge on how to help in another way using art but not necessarily an art object and um, a lot of my art has to do with experiences sometimes they end up being an object but the idea is the experience really what i am behind as an artist is that moment that instant of encounter so instead I thought about it and I came back to the director of the shelter and I said, instead of giving you an art, an art piece, I'd rather flip it and have the, the, the women at the shelter produce their own artwork and I'll donate my time and teach them how to do it. So I brought this massive artwork that I 
was working on into the shelter. And they were all, oh, can we keep it? So that started a conversation of, no, you're actually going to do it. The artwork was, um, it's part of a series that I do with, um, say, tapestry or carpets made out of used stuffed animals. And um, basically when stitch, I, what I do is I unstitch all the stuffed animals and then piece it all together in one large rug. And all these stuffed animals are used, so they're all donated, and there's a, a lot of under, under meanings that are very present in the work, but not necessarily are so much in the face or more in the aura of the piece. So when I bring these and I start telling the women how this, how this work came about, it really started with my relationship with an object, my own stuffed animal that I still have and I don't use. And so that opened up a room like this of many women telling their stories with their first teddy bear. And from there, they, they didn't know how to sew, but nor did I when I had this idea. So exchanging that, that story and telling them it's just a matter of having an idea, then you can learn how to do it. Um, I self-taught myself how to sew, and so I passed along that very valuable tool, especially for women. Um, and that became a one year long workshop of all these women and stitching stuffed animals, telling their stories, bringing photos of their family, getting to know between them, uh, some of them living in the same house and they don't even know their names or, or who's their neighbor. So it became a wonderful, really, experience even for myself, because really what I was behind was how to make an artwork happen with, now I can use all these hands to help, and in thinking that I would have a piece for the auction, and it really became a one-year workshop, which was a lot more meaningful um, than the final piece that we did there. Um, I guess that what I'm trying to say is inviting them to be part of a of a process and and showing them how really there's everything to learn all the time. Uh, what happened to the work at the end? Well, the work in the end was wonderful. Uh, it went to the to the shelter, uh, so it went back to them. So from them wanting me to give them the piece that I brought, they actually became a lot more attached to the one they made, because in this one they all had a voice, they were all designing it together, they were all sewing it together. Uh, so actually I guess that including them was a lot more effective than just giving something away that how is it made, you know, it's like the magic of the artist studio, it's really work, it's not magic. Right. <laughs> Is it still at the shelter, or was it still Yeah, yeah. it is at the shelter. It, it ended up belonging to them. They didn't even want to give it away. <laughs> and that's a very, that's usually what happens with artists, you know? You're like, you make a piece and you're yeah. like, and now this has a price, and it's, that's another whole dialogue. Uh, and it made a lot of sense also, just the idea of the shelter and creating a sort of like a piece all together that will remain in the space. So I guess we all learned. So so he became an actual for being in the show, yeah. in this project, as well as mm -hmm. uh, Antonia. And then when you know, I came in here in September, but you, you started working for us at, um, as full-time December? December? December. December. And we started talking about this project, and at the same time, I had mind wanting to do research and development um, where art artists would be invited to occupy art galleries and just work and not necessarily have an end product. And the, at, at one point we were thinking of them as two different projects and then it occurred to us they actually were one project and um, that the artists who you had picked as well as two additional artists I had recommended, um, Tom and uh, Rick, uh, were the really 
interesting together as a, a dynamically to bring them together as um, uh, you know to, uh, to meet each other. Some of you you've never met before, um, but to create a community out of artists who we both thought were really um, strong, serious, committed, and had an element of art activism as part of their background as well. So um, I'm glad that we were able to, to get the two together and looking forward to the results. Now, neither one of you have, have, have either one of you have done a project like that where you've, um, whether with homelessness or um, working towards another social issue that you've been involved with? Um, so I, I teach, um, you know, I've adjuncted at a lot of schools in South Florida. I've also, you know, I've also taught, um, you know, at the school level, uh, elementary age children. Uh, and so I've done some, I, 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 I would think, pretty ambitious projects that were, that in a way are very similar to the process that Augustina was talking about. change in helping a community. Um, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm from Haiti, and so I've been watching, you know, year after year after East catastrophe kind of comes to to, to, the, to the forefront of the news that presents Haiti in the context. And I'm, as in my studio, I'm always wrestling with those ideas of to, like, what can the studio do to kind of go into those spaces and to actually make interventions. So for this exhibition, it kind of presents, you know, a very similar question about displacement and also belonging. So uh, I think that my studio has actively been considering like those just just what it means to be an artist and wanting to kind of present systems or ideas that can intervene. Um, for me, in my case, it's been just having a research-based process that actually looks at history and tries to redefine myth and the icon in those contexts of presenting a, a, a body to and what's interesting, and the way your studio is already set up, it's like, because last year uh, Rick participated in Trading Places, which was a studio that I had created at um, my former museum, MOCA. And you have projects already in place that were some of the results of your um, research and development at, in Trading Places. So it's interesting to see a continuity. Yeah, I think that's the best part about like these programs. And they actually help cultivate activity in the studio. And the questions that kind of lurk during the, the time span spent working and researching don't leave your studio. Like it's a new addition to your practice, a new addition to you as like an extension of, 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 of the time here. So um, like there's no way I could have left any of those, those pieces behind. They actually are pieces that I actually meditate on actively in the studio, uh, even away from the museum. And then Antonia, you, you took it upon yourself to invite other artists to occupy your space. <laughs> Tell us how, how that came about. Well, I was thinking about the concept and just like the museum is so generous to give us these spaces. Like when I was in creating spaces, um, I made so much work. I mean, I have a show up now at Sanello Projects and three of the videos that I made at MoCA are being displayed. And so it's just like this really, really like very generous action is a place where they gave us a studio and a museum and the research and the facilities and I was just thinking in terms of the other project where that addresses homelessness, how they can relate. And so I was thinking I'm very lucky to know two very talented artists who I left here who um, who needed studio space. So kind of mirroring that spirit I thought, well how better to approach this than to actually give the space to people who really need it. So So you you kind of played it forward, <laughs> really? Yeah, well, more conceptual, I guess. Is yeah. How I address it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's sort of like the guy who's leaving money all around and <laughs> yeah. you know, he's trying to give it to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> but there is, but that is, I mean, just the gesture itself is a work of art that you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think of it that way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, but 
you guys, you're already settled in. Right, you right, yeah. didn't get a thing. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, right, yeah. We're excited. Now, there's another element of it in that you are all, the, um, I think most of you are going to be working out in the community as well. And um, Luke, you want to talk about that part of the project and how they're going to be working with our partners? Um, yeah, I mean, there's. Um, just for our partnership with Homeless, which I've discussed a little bit already. Um, we are um, starting to, since Bonnie came on, she's been trying to kind of reconnect with Nova Southeastern University, which owns the museum, and um, we'll be working with the School of Multidisciplinary Studies, which Dr. McKay is uh, ahead of. Um, so she's, uh, she's going to be seeing more of us, and we'll be seeing more of her. I think it's just a, a way to, to connect, I guess the beginning of the project was, you know, trying to trying to address a really big topic that you can't really address yourself or even one organization can't really address and um, seeing how many, how many different pieces you can get together to make it, you know, a bigger and better project. Um, so, yeah, that's it. I think that's <laughs> so, I think I finished my thought. So, Antonio, yeah, I, um, uh, the reporter from the Sun Sentinel interviewed me last week, and he started telling me about your project, which I hadn't heard yet. And when he told me, he said, well, what do you think about it? And I said, well, I haven't talked to her about it, but I think this is a really great project with the recording of the sounds. And, you know, and I gave an interpretation, and then I thought, Oh, what if I'm wrong and he prints this? And then, and then I saw the interview and he quoted Antonia saying exactly what I had said. So I was like, okay, <laughs> not a bad heart historian after all. So can you tell us about the project? And, and, I, and I just thought it, it's wonderful and, and how you're going to realize it. So I'll be teaching six classes at a shelter here in Broward. And I started actually last night with my first class. Um, we're addressing sound art as a medium. Um, sound art is a art medium that's been around for a long time, but last summer it had its first exhibition at the MoMA, and then at the Met, and so now it's sort of gaining um, more acceptance, and I was thinking of it as a medium. Um, it was kind of the perfect fit, I thought, for to teach the homeless, because you have a group of people who are often ignored or who don't necessarily have a voice. And so through these workshops, I'm hoping to empower uh, the guests of the shelter um, through these different actions. So we're gonna be making what I'm calling sound portraits. Um, so we're exploring sound, what it means, what sound art is, like how it's used um, you know, for humans and then for animals and how we kind of perceive it now. And then um, through a series of creative writing workshops uh, and exercises, we are creating portraits of each individual of the class. So we're making our own sounds. For each person, they'll have like their own sound portrait. So it'll be um, a compilation of sounds that will kind of present them as they are. And then it will be in an exhibition here. But, yeah, that's the other part of this project is that the front part of the space on the second floor will be activated as exhibition space constantly changing. So it's a good reason to keep coming back and seeing the projects. And um, and with yours, you're you're sinking the speakers into the walls, so you won't see anything other than white walls. And and the sound is you're going to hear sound, but but. The sound isn't distinguishable enough until you really go all the way up close and basically hug the wall in order to hear it. Um, so, what is that going to do? How does it's it's a, it's a clear metaphor, but how does that tie in with the whole subject of what we're discussing, and how does it change the viewer in the process? Yeah, well, I think a lot of my work is about empathy, and I'm hoping that this project by listening to sound portrait, you'll realize that the people who make them are all um, dynamic and very human and have this innate capacity to create beauty. So I'm hoping that it will invoke empathy in the viewer and hopefully cause awareness toward homelessness and um, different reactions to how we treat each other. That's my goal. No, 
um, yeah, I, I thought, and, and the idea of the uh, making the invisible visible, mm -hmm. uh, or, or at least people without a voice to have um, have a voice, and the intimacy, um, which is something that um, wouldn't necessarily happen. So, um, so I, I was pleased when I saw that I had the right interpretation of it. Um, now, um, with Tom, you're going to be doing. Um, activating the space every week in a certain way. You already, he actually has a work up already. You might not realize it um, in his space. You want to tell them about the first project? Um, yeah, so the first piece I have in the gallery is actually, um, it's um, a signpost. Um, and it was actually taken from outside of the museum. It was an object that had been discarded. Can, can you talk a little about that? Okay, I'm sorry. So there was a signpost that had been discarded on the side of the road, like literally, it's on the same block as the museum. It's just simply a case of bringing that object in and uh, uh, you know, siding and placing it within uh, within the gallery space that I've been designated. Uh, and for me, what what I think is really interesting about the the taking and the installation of this object is that the the way that it's installed in the gallery is not installed as a it's not necessarily installed as like a, like a formal object, a sculpture, something that would be in the middle of the space, but it's actually kind of, it lines up with a, a partition that's already in the wall. So it's somewhat peripheral, but then it's also kind of, um, it becomes an obstacle. So you're kind of aware of it, but you're not. And so it, I think it retains some of its kind of like almost civic, like maybe uh, civic or authoritarian, not authoritarian, it's not the right word. Instructional, maybe instructional. Yeah. It's a little bit of sign. It, it still retains that that presence, but you know, it's it's been displaced. Um, and you know, just picking up on what Rick talked about, this idea of uh, like activism. But I, th I think it's really interesting this idea of being active and, and like actually actively participating within a situation. So for me, uh, being involved in the show and activating space on a weekly basis with, with new projects is about kind of participating within the situation. So it could be it could be the, the, the situation of the, uh, of the gallery uh, of the museum as a kind of an institution uh, but it could it, for me the, this idea of situation is broader right So uh, I'm also interested in this idea of uh, like Fort Lauderdale, you know, What's my relationship to, to Fort Lauderdale? Like I, up until this exhibition, I hadn't really been to Fort Lauderdale, so I'm I'm somewhat of an outsider, uh, and so I'm going to be responding to all of these different things, and also the uh, the concerning belonging, uh, the the, you know, the 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 title of the show, the the concept of the show, the concerning belonging. I think inevitably the works will will address or will refer refer to to that idea. So I'll be you know responding to these different, I guess, sites of concern. And um, Augustina, you have another a very labor-intensive project that you're going to be doing um, with our community partners. <coughs> yeah. yeah, when just like Antonia and Tasha, <laughs> the missing artists, <laughs> missing. the, the <laughs> three of us um, were initially brought in to to teach workshops at the at this um, homeless facility, so um, I guess that for us three, the premise has been the other way around. Instead of having a space and in, and research, as for example Tom is talking, um, for us it was the other way around. We started with the premise that we were teaching to these individuals that were already in this situation. And then through the process and the merging of these two ideas, um, the studios and the workshops, we also have a space at the museum. So for me as an artist, yeah, it's, it's important to see what, what's the relationship of what I'm doing as an artist in a, in a private space that would be a studio, and what's the relationship of what I'm teaching in the workshops which is really the reason why I'm mostly interested in being involved in a program like this. Um, 
So during my six workshops that I will be teaching at the homeless shelter, I will again engage in a collaborative process with all of them, inviting them all to work in one piece. I've been a teacher for many years and the most success I have has been when all the hands are involved together because of the conversations that are raised. And also, I'm very interested in the role distribution, how everyone actually finds its voice in a community, uh, working all together towards the same goal. So there's a very dynamic and fruitful conversation that, that usually arises. And again, my work is never about the end result. Even in my own practice, I have never I am not behind beauty, I am not behind any aesthetic um, result. If that happens, it's a result of a positive process. So I would say that I am very much informed by all processes always. Um, I was reading an article about homelessness and this writer wrote that homeless, to be homeless is not um, it's not um, a static um, situation, but it actually is a process. And I thought that that was a very interesting way of seeing this idea of being homeless as a process. Uh, in this sense, um, I will be bringing a very big map of the world, and I am inviting all the, all the people to sand this map together, so they're gonna sand it. Yeah. With um, sandpaper, they'll remove all the surface of this map. Uh, what happens with this is the surface remains white, most of the times with traces of the color of what was there, say the water, or the green of the lands, or the brown of the mountains. That usually maintains because the ink stains the paper. I collect the dust when I sand, so once again I'm going to invite these people to collect the dust of this, the remnants, the, the dust actually is the cartography. And um, this is millions of years of information of us trying to understand and nail down lines and names and, right? So um, I started doing some experiments with this dust, compressing it, and make it into chalk. And for my exhibition, um, the idea was to bring what we are doing at the workshops and exhibit it at the museum. In this case, instead of exhibiting the erased map, which will of hopefully um, bring conversations about belonging and home, since right we're sending away the planet, um, the idea, though, is not to exhibit the map, but actually to exhibit the chalk. So in my previous experiment, when I did exhibit chalk, it's, I'm very interested in the relationship that audience have with our work. And usually in a museum, we're not allowed to touch things. But in my last experience of exhibiting chalk, not a single person thought where they were at, and the chalks were gone in <laughs> two hours. <coughs> so I thought that there was a very interesting relationship back then to see how an audience that is entering a museum where you're not allowed to touch and you have an inch, a security person right by the chalk that doesn't stop saying, please don't touch, it's an artwork, please don't touch, it's an artwork. <laughs> Yet every single person, no matter how old they were, they would have this instinct of grabbing the first tool that we used to write. Because really that's what chalk, right? But then this chalk is actually made out of dust of, of a map that has been sanded. So I'm kind of excited to continue this exploration and instead of having an actual object being produced by Right, and, and actually exhibit this, actually exhibit the process of something that continue being in transformation.
because once this chalk is used, it comes back again into dust, right? So this idea of the ephemeral became very present in this idea of the homelessness. I was watching a video in YouTube a few days ago, and it was, um, they gathered five people out of a crowd and they have contacted um, fam fam family of these five people. S these five people were didn't know what was going on, but basically it was sort of like a secret camera. This guy, um, for example, the, the video is that it's a camera in the streets and basically families of these five chosen characters are dressed as homeless in the, in the ground. And basically, the, the awareness video is about how you don't even see these people in the floor anymore. You rather avoid them with your view. So this back again to this idea of the invisible and the, maybe you don't even want to know what's going on. You just rather keep on walking. And um, what was interesting in this secret camera was that it was his wife who was dressed as a homeless and he didn't even know. Or it was his sister who was thrown there with, right? So then these five people are shown the video, and in the video is when they realize that they didn't even realize that who was in the floor was his wife or his son. Or so this is a campaign, a homeless campaign in video that's done. But to me, that video was was very much about these topics of ephemera and, and the idea of invisible that I was sort of already tapping on. So, so during my studio, I'm, I'm, meanwhile I have a space in the studio in the museum, right? That's for two months and a half almost, a space where I am invited to explore with these things. And so this video brought up this idea of the invisible a lot more present and um, I'm going to be exploring with thermo, thermo paint. It's a paint that um, responds to the heat, right? To the body. So do you guys remember, for example, when we were kids, the t-shirts, the thermal t-shirts that with your, with your, the heat of your body would change color? And then once it's out of your body, it comes back to the same color, right? So this existing paint as well, and it can be applied in in different surfaces and in existence paper. But it's just when the presence is there that it marks a trace and then once the body's out, the paper or the paint or the surface comes back to being the way it was. So I don't know what I'm going to be doing. It's a human <laughs> exploration it's all with the right paint. But definitely that's how I'm hoping to sort of parallel this research of what's happening at the shelter, why these people are, you know, erasing again, erasing away, and then meanwhile, this idea of the warmth or the heat or the presence of the body in, in a space. What will you hope, what do you hope to achieve with this project? What were you hoping um, out in the community and with the artists, and with the institution? Well, I mean, I think it's, it's nice to think that um, it's nice to think that art's important or that it can make a difference. Um, I guess you could always say with any any project like this, um, you know, is it is it actually going to affect the homeless clients that are going to be participating in the workshops, or is it just a way to be like, good job, you know, you did way to way to like bring it to those people and that's it, you know, like. So I, my hope, of course, is that um, this has a very positive effect on everyone involved, including the artists. And um, it's, I think, very good that a museum is willing to uh, focus on social issues that are, let's say, more than historical uh, social issues, like what, what current issues um, can a museum address, especially when it's putting on shows that are you know, largely uh, dead artists or even, um, you know, artists who have already been framed in a certain context and uh, may still be relevant but maybe aren't as, um, like now, as, um, as
as people on the street, for example. Um, and I guess those are the two the two main things I could hope for. Um, but other than that, you know, I've been I've been working with everyone here, trying to get their spaces set up with them, um, and and just listening to what their plans are, and just you know, from one day to the next, uh, seeing how they are developing their approach and kind of rethinking it on a daily basis. So I don't know that I, you know, I have those hopes, but I don't really have many expectations anymore for for what's going to happen in the end because. Um, I think a lot of my expectations have kind of been exceeded at this point by the artists just thinking and developing and, and pushing forward with what they want to do in, a re I think, really, really interesting ways. You know, I mean, Tom was talking about his simple chunk of metal on the ground, and, you know, he's, I was like, I helped him carry it up the stairs. We, we took it <laughs> off the street. You didn't do anything like, illegal there by taking the no. <laughs> I had to stood it right away. <laughs> the moment I said, do we need a guard? There's no one trip, so I said, I got it. <laughs> yeah, that's, I was talking about this with him. I was like, look, man, we might need to, we might need to, like, put a spotlight on it or tape it out. He looks at me, he's like, tape it out? What are you talking about? It's supposed to be, like, just sitting on the ground like that. And I was like, all right, Tom. Um, but, you know, like, I've been obviously running back and forth through that space for the last few days. Um, it's just the first week we're all getting set up and everything. And the coolest thing about the piece is that I've only seen two people actually walk around it. Everyone steps so over it, yeah. which is fascinating because, you know, there, there's like three feet of space on one side and four feet of space on the other that you could easily walk around this thing. It's only, you know, that high and everyone kind of looks at it for a second and no one even looks at it as they walk over it. Like, it's one of those things where you just like, you, you record where it is, this little barrier in your mind, you decide that you can actually step over it. And then you tell yourself, I don't even need to look at it because it's such a short thing and you've already gauged that distance. And when you're talking about something that's guiding and a barrier, I think that that's really fascinating um, just in the way that it is placed. Um, so I think I understand a lot of your approach with that right now, just seeing people interact with it. Yeah. And that's super cool. You're also doing another work that's very provocative um, with a neon. Mm -hmm. I want to explain that a bit because that I until I read the article in San Centro, I didn't know the whole history of the phrase that you're using. Um, so I'm having a... Okay. <laughs> so I'm having a sign made, uh, it's gonna be in red, white, and blue. Uh, neon. Yeah, neon. Uh, and it's gonna say, uh, interest in aesthetics. And it's actually language, uh, it's a statement that's actually been lifted from a recent ordinance that's been passed by uh, the city of Fort Lauderdale. That is, um, uh, it's a prohibition on uh, uh, the storage of personal belongings as well as uh, as well as human waste in in the public environment. So, if you have a big box or you have a box and you leave, or maybe even a bag, and you leave it on a bench, that that object can be confiscated. And what kind of struck me, I so. I came about this through an article and just doing some more research. This interest in aesthetics has been quoted multiple times in, in multiple uh, newspapers and blogs. And it was just such a strong statement in relationship to the function, the role, the interest of the museum at large. And uh, so this kind of connection. Uh, you know, the, the piece is very specific as, as it it, uh, the, you know, the genesis for the piece was this very kind of controversial um, um, ordinance. Uh, at the same time, I think uh, as a statement, it also kind of relates to the museum. Um, and, you know, th this notion of aesthetics, I think, is really interesting. You know, I'm not so uh, so interested in in notions of beauty and taste, however I think they're incredibly important kind of ideas, concepts, things to think about, uh, but you know, I'm kind of interested in this idea of um, like how we perceive things, aesthetics as an act of perceiving the, you know, the world around us, and then acting in response to those things. So, uh, and then as for the red, white, and blue component, uh, it was, act I, it was uh, 
it was, an, it's an, it was ordered by a Neon company, and they had this generic template. And I typed in the words, and I didn't choose the colors, and it just came up red, white, and blue. It just seemed like a kind of interesting. So you use chance, or? Yeah, chance, but then I think it also talks about the, like, the, the language of signs. If we look at commercial signage, Neon's red, like, you know, it's either red and white, or white and blue, or red and blue, or red, white, and blue. It's like it, so it, I think that it talks about this kind of commercial act, aspect, a sense of kind of almost commodification. Well, it's about and, visibility mm -hmm. again. Those are the most visible colors. Mm -hmm. yeah. And and then also this ordinance, that, you know, there was like strong commercial interests who were pushing this ordinance through. So you know, by had kind of literalizing the statement in neon, I wanted to refer to to these kind of to these interests. Mm -hmm. I think it might be a good time to open it up to the audience. Uh, do I say, will the visitors uh, to the museum be able to see your videos? <coughs> and and how will that work? Uh, um, and everyone decides whether or not they want their space open all the time, or like when they're in there, if they don't want people who are in there. And then we also have uh, certain open? evenings that we have open studios and conversations, and we'll be having. Uh, some of the uh, faculty and graduate students from NSU with the artists, our community partners, leading discussions uh, during those open studios. I can't quite picture it. Is it <coughs> closed, like going into a, a, a room? We'll, 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 we'll go over it. Oh, yeah, you can. Uh -huh. the only thing, when yeah. you get to Rick's space with the white floor, take off your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Those, those heel marks of mine, I'm sorry, nobody told me. <laughs> yeah, um, I just want to congratulate all of you for getting to this point in your lives, and your young lives. Um, but I wanted to know, um, I have a personal professional interest in asking this question, where is the research coming in? And you know what will happen with all these, one, these people you're working with? And you know I've seen so many things that's the end of it. You know, you're giving so much of yourselves and involving these people, and then what will happen? What are the plans? Is there any um, next step? Well, the um, the workshop results uh, are going to be, um, well, the workshops are wrapping up at the end of July. We're going to be having the, you know, quote unquote, opening for the show that is, it's a big work in progress, but we're going to do an actual opening for it on August 2nd. and. Um, we're going to be putting up the workshop results then, and following up with uh, the artists and the clients from BPHI, as well as anyone, um, other organizations involved, as well as people at the museum who have been involved, and doing qualitative <coughs> case study, um, just on the on the project, and seeing if we can create a, uh, not really a template, but sort of a, a study into what it was, what was positive, what could be rethought better, and then approaching um, other arts organizations in areas with high homelessness and seeing if they'd be interested in, um, you know, approaching that project from their own viewpoint um, and just offering them kind of guidance and advice if they did want to do something similar. Um, there, we're also videotaping the process. So, um, you know, at, um, at MOCA we had a program called Women on on the rise, it's now 10 years old, working with young, um, teenage girls at risk. And the, um, and Tasha who's not with us, that's with you, and you worked on that too. Did you work that one? I that one. Okay. The, um, it became um, the program for working with teenage girls. Um, uh, the lesson plans were then put on Rutgers mm -hmm. University's um, uh, feminist um, uh, studies workshop. So that um, it could be replicated by other um, groups around wherever. Um, uh, Rosemary worked on that as well. Rosemary um, Wilson. So, um, so the idea is that this is you know experiment, and um, the results would um, become something that could be replicated, where it would you know quantify it, um, document it, and um, and something that we you know. Had, Women on the Rise program, we know had an impact, and you were working with Lotus House, you saw the, um, the impact on, on the daily lives. And the, and the question is, you know, art activism 
Does it do anything? Does it, um, is, is it going to change the world? Is well, on a, on a personal level and to the question that, that you were, that you brought, it's always, to me, that's always my, I don't, I don't use the word problem in my vocabulary, but it's always the insatisfaction of, okay, I have a workshop for six weeks and then what? What do I do with that? What do they do with it? Six weeks is not enough to heal a thing, really. It's, it's such a, I've, te I've taught, I'm involved with, a, with, a, with an organization that Tom actually, you also were with us for learning and, and by mistake I was once given a, given a very extreme class where I had blind kids and total autistic and I don't have any experience but I ended up in this situation and my head was like, well, this is these things are not mistake. There must be a reason. Take it on. And from that experience, I've learned that it's like taking a vacation that you'll never forget. Right? It's like that vacation that will always be with you in your head. And maybe you went that place once in your life and you never came back, but you will still remember that moment. So hopefully, I take that, that has been Usually when I go into this, like, but, you know, you just want to heal the world, really. You want to not see this or make it effective, and then it becomes like, is art effective? Can we do something? I don't know, at least. Well, it, you know, just from your least. projects alone, the idea of the socializing and um, bringing everybody together, and they didn't even know each other in most cases. Right. And the um, socializing, the collaboration, the um, the work to you know, to create an end product, um, right there is transformative. Whether someone takes that along or you as a person are totally. taking it along as well, um, it's creating a dynamic that didn't exist before, and one way or another will will have an impact. There's this. Uh, is it Franklin the one who who I don't know very well the quote, maybe anyone here probably knows it better, that says, if you teach me, I listen, right? If, if you tell me, I listen, if you teach me, I've learned, if you include me, I'll understand. So, and we're doing that with the, with the visitors to the museum as well. It's not just, it's not as if it's these are photographs, and which nothing wrong with that, but it's the fact that you, are making decisions navigating through the space. And then you realize what you did. And that this is something you probably do all the time, makes you stop and think. Or the fact that you really do need to become very intimate with the wall to hear the sounds um, that are invisible, you know, from being made from people you can't see. That too is gonna to change you in one way or another. Um, so, or even the, the way language is used. Um, as Tom's doing with this sign. It's already impacted me just thinking about your projects and okay, can it have large change? I don't know, but if every single person that comes through somehow or other, they stop and think it's going to have some kind of impact. Can you guys tell us the invited <laughs> artists that Antonio's brought in? <laughs> sure. I have been working at the museum for the last couple of months and um, I somehow have become fascinated with organizing, archiving, um, making inventories, realizing that we bought, let me make an example, uh, another box of one and a half inch screws. But in reality, it's because we don't know that in this other room, there's a box of them. So I thought of bringing all these things and organizing and charting them and knowing where everything was. And then I uh, was invited to have a studio, which I don't have. And I thought uh, one, of the, one of my tasks was to 
um, empty an area on the third floor that had books and books and books and millions of books. And so I'm going through them thinking that they're now maybe forgotten, maybe displaced for a little bit. And there are these books that when I went to art school, or I, I was born in Colombia, so in the third world even more, any of these books becomes almost like sacred. They're like Bibles. They have all the illustrations of the most amazing things, and, and they're expensive, and they're displayed. But here they were hidden. And so I thought, wouldn't it be awesome to take the books that have duplicates? So of course I won't touch them if there's only one. I will archive those chronologically. But I thought, wouldn't it be awesome to have a, an enormous wall where I choose to cut out only the images, not the text, only the images, place them chronologically, and then at the end, you're going to have, I'm not going to take all of art history because I'm sure there's a lot of books that are out there, but all of the high art or all of the collected or sought after or studied art in one panel. And then I thought, oh, what if I can just take it further and also have an area where there's maps and you start understanding how a war affected something is what historians do, but what if there's this accessible way to just read it as one? Or I pictured, um, just like when you see in a museum someone studying a painting, having like access to a painting and, and you see kids sketching him and I thought, wouldn't it be awesome to just sit there and even for me, like, wow, let's study the color palette of this era. Or, or wow, you can really see a pattern in the way photographs are taken, or whatever. And then I thought, that's awesome <coughs> as an art piece itself, but if we're really dealing with this issue of homelessness, belonging, space, being home, not being home, how can I incorporate that? Because I... Um, most of the work I make, if not all the work I make, has a very, not emotional, uh, but a personal kind of charge. The reason why I make art is to deal with certain things that are going on. And I have been thinking lately, if I only make art when things are crazy in my life, or there's, there's something that, that's really challenging, like things like, my mom dying. Like, if I'm really dependent on something like that happening to make art, then what I just need awful things to happen all the time to be able to produce work. So I think those two things intersected. And when I was um, writing my little explanation, I said, let me take it two steps back and really read the definition of what's homeless. What is property? What's um, what's a museum? What is um, what's a home? And I found this awesome way to connect everything. I realized that times have changed a lot, and our the idea, the visual idea we have, or the the understanding we have of certain things is a little maybe old-fashioned and by that I mean that even to me I thought if I think of extreme poverty I imagine black and white post-war people boiling wallpaper to be able to like at least eat some of the glue. Same with abuse. The women who end up at the Lotus House must have gone through crazy things therefore that's why they're there. Abuse is this extreme case. Poverty is this ex extreme case. Homelessness is this extreme case. And I then realized, when on the computer, define poverty line, define poverty level. And I realized that by income, I am on the poverty line. <laughs> and so I thought, how interesting, because we I don't know if maybe we feel embarrassed or it's just easy or that's just the way our brains have been wired. But we don't see around us, just like we go back to the invisible homeless and we have this idea of the invisible homeless. 
it, invisible, we're invisible also because maybe some of us have gone through some of these things. Uh, not because we don't know any better, not because we're not good enough. I think there's somewhat this distance, maybe arrogance in some cases, but it's always like, when I hear people talking about these issues, it feels like this, these poor people who are here. Even, even I, even some of my close friends have ended up for circumstances completely outside of their desires have ended up the Lotus House, maybe for a night, maybe for two. And so I thought, wow, this is a lot closer, not to say, well, I'm homeless too, so I dealt with it. But how awesome is it to realize, in a way, I realize, well, if, if by the numbers, like if on paper I'm poor, how is it that I don't feel poor? I feel like somehow, things happen, I feel like, basically like a princess, like, I think once there's that sense of abundance, I just feel like there's always access to everything. And I recently separated this year, so I decided to move out of my house, and, and I could afford a small space, and I brought just a couple of things, and I've been dealing a lot in my work with how much do you really need? How can you survive with very little? How, what is your life like when you're forced to just have almost nothing and, I don't know, meditate, pray, figure it out? And so I find myself at, at this tiny new house where I live with few things, still feel like it's a mansion. It's in Northside and I'm excited because they're going to open a police department really close to me. And so then I have access to a museum to be in a museum, to have a studio in a museum. It's like all lines are, you know, museums are supposed to be where high art is displayed and only certain classes go to museums. But then for like two and a half months or three, I'm feeling home at a museum. And like all these lines crossed and that's what I'm going to be doing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I <laughs> uh, I, I spent the last six years taking pictures at LifeNet for Fail Me the Homeless, and I probably have between five and 10,000 pictures of maybe 500 to 1,000 people. And, and I applaud you because I've spent five or six years really trying to make the homeless not invisible. So I commend you for this. It's a terrible problem. I think Tom with his sign hit the nail right on the head. I was appalled when I read that they should take these people's belongings. I've sat across my camera from hundreds of these people. And, and what you're doing is an amazingly wonderful thing. I commend you and I look forward to results. Whatever they are, you're making a great, great step in making the homeless less invisible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm in my research and development phase now, <laughs> where I'm just building my environment right now. I can't disclose any more information. But I would suggest that if we take one more question, that we could just go downstairs and um, see what they're doing and talk to them there. It might make it a little less abstract, but George? Well, uh, a lot of the conversation here has moved from the uh, revolved around working <clears throat> Excuse me. Creating artwork in a social environment, and yet the kind of common sense people have is of uh, art artists being sequestered in in the studio and needing privacy in order to you know plummet the depths of their concerns. And uh, a number of you have worked in a public setting at MoCA specifically recently, um, but also have one time or another, probably most of your working lives had uh, private studios. I'm interested in anybody talking about how their sense of, uh, of the work process for themselves has, has shifted in because they were involved kind of in both spheres. But, um, you can talk about that, Rick. Because sure, you usually are very quiet and personal, and this gives you a completely different platform. I'll, I'll 
most talk. I think I was, uh, most, I think home is almost like, I work at home, my studio is at home. And so I think this, I was contemplating like just the studio as a dwelling, a place of, of, just, of just, just what it means to dwell in the studio. And just the intimacy of like when you have like um, moments that are sensitive where you, you, you don't want the studio to be engaged, you want to close off the studio. So to kind of re-transplant the studio to the museum is kind of like re reevaluating those vulnerable kind of like um, ideas that kind of are looming somewhere in the, in the practice that you don't want to come forward. So for me, I kind of had to kind of, kind of, kind of ask for white floors to kind of reset the, the boundaries of the context for myself to present it as a dwelling, to kind of kind of present that that sacred space, you know what I mean? But reactivate it into you know an, an imaginative space, knowing that it's a public space is critical, and you know anyone can walk into the space and interact with me and say something or move something around and to try to you know re really rediscover that space with me. So it's really like opening op opening up my home or opening up a home to to a public. And, in, in, in the context of this exhibition for me. So I think it's, it's those, those dualities of having that private private space you know, becoming public um, and not losing anything in the studio. Because once you move your things to the space, there's years, <coughs> of, there's two years worth of research and work that's already active. You know, you chance losing that work in this space, in this context, when the studio's here and is active and being moved around. You know, by different ideas and, 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 and people, so it's, it's kind of chancy for me. Did I understand correctly that you painted the floor white in order to give other people, as well as reminding yourself that this isn't just another room where somebody's doing stuff, but that people should treat it with um, with a higher level of regard? Exactly, exactly. I think it's it's, it's that philosophy. I kind of run my studio now. Trying to find a um, more, I don't know, contemplating quality of life before I contemplate, you know, making an object and making my environment as comfortable as possible, having a happy studio and making, then from that perspective, good things happen as opposed to, you know, contemplating objects or material, conceptual things. Yeah, so making it as pleasant as possible in the space is really good. Making it home. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Like, okay. Well, thank one. you. I, I know that um, there's still more questions, but it probably is best um, if everyone to go downstairs, second floor. And I thank our artists.